Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a cool guest for you this week. He is not an author, I don't think. We'll ask him. <laughs> but he is Jeffrey Bruner from the Fussy Librarian, which is an ebook sponsorship site that's been around for several years now. I actually remember when you guys got started. I'm feeling old. <laughs> but uh, they send out daily emails for all different genres of fiction and nonfiction. And Jeffrey sees a lot of books coming his way. So we're hoping he can give us some insight into kind of what's working and then what's not as far as giving clicks, at least from uh, his point of view. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, do you want to correct me? Are you an author that I do not know about? I am, actually. Um, before I started The Fussy Librarian, I wrote two books under a pen name and, uh, and then started Fussy and didn't have time to write anymore. So um, that's uh, waiting for retirement, I guess, if that ever comes. So. Yeah, we had uh, Damon from Book Funnel on. Similar problem. He, he has a trilogy out, but uh, <laughs> it's been a few years since he had time, I think, to write anything else. Yeah, no, and I left, I left my readers kind of hanging at the end of the second book, and um, I feel guilty about it, but there's only so many hours in the day. Mm. And uh, what made you, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of what made you decide to start The Fussy Librarian? Um, well, I was a journalist for many years, um, for about 25 years, and um, as everyone knows, the uh, journalism industry has been going through rough times for oh, about the last 15 years, and uh, I worked at a newspaper and got to the point where uh, a couple times each year people would get laid off. And uh, I knew that sooner or later it was going to get to me and I needed to figure out a plan B. And so I uh, started up the Fussy Librarian and would come home and work on it in the evening after work and uh, for about a year. And then at that point, uh, things were at a point where I could uh, quit my job before I lost it and uh, work full time on Fussy. So, um, and that was uh, five years ago. We're going to celebrate our fifth anniversary um this fall cool congratulations and uh i like i said i, I think i was there from the beginning for your site because I so, I just, yeah. yeah you just had sort of a unique unique name and maybe there's more of them out there now there weren't quite as many back in whatever 2012 or 13. Um, yeah what? there's quite a few more and i would say there's maybe 40 or 50 sites now and I would say we were between five and ten five years ago. So um, there was a bit of a shakeout at the time when um, Amazon uh, banned the use of, uh, or they cl clamped down on affiliate payments regarding free ebooks. It was kind of a shakeout at that point. But then the numbers started to climb up again. And so we've, there's a lot of people in the, a lot of competitors now. Right. And are you actually able to use affiliate links in your newsletter or do you send them to your website first so that you can use them? We, we are not allowed to use them in our newsletters. Um, we can use them on the website and we, we try to do that there. We don't do a redirect like um, BookBub does. Um, I don't think I've got the server capacity to, to handle uh, the additional traffic that that would generate properly. Um, so it sounds like most of your income probably comes from authors purchasing comes ads. From books. Yes. <laughs> yes, most of my revenue comes from book sponsorship. Uh, we do some uh, copy editing and proofreading and have some revenue from there, but I would say 95% uh, of our revenue comes from author sponsorships. I feel like a lot of authors getting in the business, seeing like how successful BookBub is and, and some of these other guys that have been around for a while think might often think I should start one of these. But uh, I remember from your early newsletters, you'd, you'd kind of tell everything and you're like, I'm getting a loan and uh, we need to redo the, the website. Was it pretty difficult, do you think? It, you know, you have to really be committed to it, I would guess. You do, you have, and you have to be willing to, um, like I, I I uh, I decided that I was going to make less money initially for a while than um, than I was at my old job, so that I could reinvest in the business. 
And, um, but yeah, I mean, you've got to keep reinvesting in the business and it's, it's not inexpensive to run. I, I don't think most people understand that it's, um, a lot more complicated than just, well, I mean, people just think of it as just sending out emails, but when you're sending them out in that volume, it's not cheap. Um, our free newsletter has 136,000 subscribers. And so, and our bargain email has 135,000 subscribers. So, um, so that's what two, 275, uh, roughly going out every day and uh, whether it's MailChimp or another service, you know, it's cost money to send that out as well as marketing, which is uh, very expensive. Um, we've spent, we've been growing our free newsletter a lot um, so far this year and uh, we've spent like, about $150,000 just on marketing since January. And that was, yeah, that was the loan that you were talking about. Um, and it's not all gone, but most of it is. Um, but yeah, so things like that, um, redoing the website, upgrading the server to handle more traffic, um, all those sorts of things, they all, they all add up. Yeah, I think a, a, a handful of the people watching this show are, are aware of the costs associated with sending out a lot of emails. Like we've we've had more than a few people on this show talk about figuring out how to get the the dead weight off of your list so you can get the cost down a little bit. But uh, you've mentioned that you've got uh, a both two different lists. You've got a free list and a uh, and a bargain list, right? And I believe the free list does not have a review requirement. That's correct. It does not. Uh, we're, we're more open on that one, uh, thinking that readers, for the most part, are generally more willing to be more accepting for something when it's, when it's free to them. Right. Now, when you don't have a review requirement, there's a couple of things that that sort of helps you with. Like, if the book is a new release or if you're a new author and you haven't built up a following yet. Um, like, and as you say, people are sort of... I want to say that they have lower expectations of a free book. So they're more uh, yeah, you know, willing to accept a clunker every now and then. But like, is there any concern that there might just be a cavalcade of low quality books there? We haven't found, we haven't found um, that to be a problem so far. I mean, once in a while, there's one that maybe doesn't really, that you might get some feedback on that, um, that, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, resonate with readers but those books generally don't come back for a second promotion so but yeah i think the free ebook promotion is a good strategy for building an audience especially for beginning authors um you know whether that's um a, a prequel to i mean i know that for like fantasy authors where um you know it's a completely different animal than say a romance author you know the the books are often you know a lot bigger and take a lot longer to write um and you know i i totally understand uh a reluctance to give that away but a lot some authors find that uh giving away stories related to the universe uh whether it's a prequel or whether it's a character introduction or something like that is a good way to 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 get get out there and get people interested in, in the rest of the series. So my question for you is after I looked at your website to learn more about you there, yeah, I, I see that for your free books, you have 20 genres listed and for bargain, you have 40. Can I ask you why one is twice the amount of the other? Um, I don't think the, one of the kind of simplify things, um, we're working the free list runs off of MailChimp and the way it's done is um, if there isn't a book in a genre that day, it's going to generate a blank email, where our, whereas our bargain newsletter is uh, a custom system where it's set up. And if there isn't a match that day for the subscriber, then no email goes out. So we want to make sure that there is a match, at least one match each day for the free uh, newsletter and if someone signs up to you know two or three genres odds are pretty good that they're going to have at least one book in their email that day so a lot uh, right now we just have one nonfiction genre uh, for the free letter whereas there's probably seven or eight I think categories for 
the other newsletter in nonfiction. So I, we'll probably grow it over time, but as the uh, as the subscriber list grows, but we just wanted to start out with a smaller number initially. Yeah, the, the free list being separate is something you guys have added more recently, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's been around probably about a year and a half, but we only really started uh, marketing it heavily in the last six months. Okay, well, um, as you know, I'm sure there's a lot more competition in the uh, the Kindle store and, and all the ebook stores these days. And I, I see a lot of authors saying, you know, uh, the sponsorship sites are not as effective as they used to be. Do you have any thoughts on are as many people clicking? Um, I, I know in some cases, I feel like the authors have just done the same book over and over again on the same sites. So that may be part of it. Um, but do you have any thoughts on effectiveness overall? I think um, there's going to be reduced effectiveness if you do the same book over and over unless a newsletter is growing rapidly. I mean, that's just the reality of it. I mean, some of those people are going to see a book and click on the second or third time, but there are some people that are gonna not click, you know, if they've seen it once or twice, you know, if you keep going over and over, um, you are gonna see reduced effectiveness, that's, that's for sure. Um, but in terms of the number of, on the free newsletter, um, which I can measure on clicks, because I run that through MailChimp, um, not really seeing any difference, at least in the last six months, in terms of uh, click performance or open performance. And do you, I guess you wouldn't have any way to know about this unless the authors tell you, but do you are you hearing that people after getting like a free book one, uh, that your readers or your subscribers are, you know, if they enjoy the author going on to, to buy the books, the rest in the series? I hear from the author sometimes, yes, that that is happening, um, that they're seeing sales sometimes on the same day, um, but, um, but more likely it's going to be a follow-up situation where they enjoy the first book and then go on to buy other books. But yeah, I am hearing from authors that that, that does happen. Um, and um, for like some, there's some uh, benefits. And this is uh, like, uh, there's one cookbook author, for example, um, which is a category where um, uh, some people prefer to have that in print and so she finds that when she runs free promotions, she's also getting print sales as well. Um, now it's a little atypical, but um, there are all sorts of little uh, uh, kind of unintended consequences that you don't think about until an author uh, gets in touch and lets you know how things went. Uh, that makes a lot of sense with the cookbooks. And I've actually found that uh, I have a couple box sets that I run free promos on every now and then, and I always get a nice boost in the audiobook sales at the same time. So, you know, if, it, if it's there and linked on your Amazon page, probably, I think uh, it helps. <laughs> I'm curious what you're hearing in terms of audiobooks, because um, that is an area that I think is growing in interest among readers. Um, but I think is a greater challenge for self-published authors um, because the uh, the price point is a tougher sale sometimes it, unless the reader is familiar with the author because you're asking them to you know take a chance on you know 299 ebook is one thing to take a chance on an author they don't know but a 17 or 18 dollar audiobook is a different kind of commitment. So I'm, I'm just curious what you've been hearing because it does seem like there's greater appetite for audiobooks overall. I just, I'm not, I haven't had a good sense for whether, how that's being divided up in the market though. Yeah, it's really still difficult to promo them since we don't have control over the prices uh, if we're independently publishing them or not independently publishing them. I know I got more sales like on those box sets when uh, the Whisper Sync was like $1.99 or $2.99. So they'd get the ebook for free and then they could get its three book, you know, all for one credit or only $1.99, $2.99. And I think it's like $7.99 now. And I do still find that if I, if I give away a bunch of free books, I will get some people to buy it. And I feel like that's just kind of a different um, audience that they actually prefer 
to buy audiobooks and we were talking about truck drivers before the show but uh those have been some of my people that email me and they're like i love it i, I listened to two of them today on the road so i i feel that anytime you can get a lot of attention on the ebook it will help a little bit with audiobook sales and even if it's 20 or 30 dollars a lot of people that are the diehard audiobook fans are subscribers to audible so they'll just it's kind of the credits that they already bought okay yeah yeah so but for, and then for them the more expensive the book the better because they're like oh i'm getting a 30 dollar book for my one credit versus a 9.99 book that's true um yeah because i think is there does audible have a minimum price point on auto audiobooks i can that's one area i'm not as well versed in they set the prices compared according to their whims you know it seems to be kind of on book length or you know narration time okay so we don't have yeah we can't no control <laughs> unfortunately wow that's got to be frustrating it is because it can be pretty profitable if you actually get lucky and uh, can move quite a few copies and then there was the whole situation with the romance authors recently where uh, uh, they were just getting crushed uh, payment wise um, I don't know if that's gotten any better but um, it was in terms of the outlay of money it was crazy for how little money they were getting yeah they started the subscription service for those right. who don't know and romance authors were invited to apply it was kind of selective yeah and then they were getting like 30 cents for a full listen of an entire audiobook whereas if somebody bought it it'd get you know a lot more money <laughs> right exactly well, I'm curious, you mentioned that your overall lists were like 130,000 uh, for free and somewhere in there for bargain. Do you know, I didn't ask you this ahead of time, so you may not know <laughs> how big your sci-fi and fantasy lists are right now. So like if I go did a prompt book to promo, how many people might see my, like my free book or my uh, bargain book? Oh, that's a good question. And I don't know if I know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, I think the bargain list is, 80 to 90. I don't know what the free list is, um, but it's it's probably, I would guess it's comparable, but I don't know the exact number. Um, I did a click list recently, and a click study recently, and um, I would say that sci-fi and fantasy perform um, about in the middle in terms of genres for our free ebook list. Um, uh, not going to surprise you, um, like cozy mysteries, do gangbusters, um, mysteries, thrillers, romance, um, and then um, categories like fantasy and sci-fi, I would say, are about the average. Yeah, there are certain types of, uh, of books that, like, like when you're when you're looking at looking at epic fantasy, you're not probably burning through epic fantasy. You're looking for something that's gonna last you a while. But there are a lot of like thrillers, mysteries, and romances are definitely the sort of thing where people just need a long list of them. Um, but all right, so uh, back to the 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 some stuff I saw about your uh, your free list at the very least. Uh, you don't have to link to directly to a store. Like you had mentioned, you can link to an Insta freebie or to your author site. Do you see people doing that with any regularity? Yeah, some some do. Um, lot, quite a few people are experimenting with, with Insta Freebie, and I think they're finding that um, uh, their cost per their their cost per sign up is better than if they were say out on f Facebook or doing Google Ad Click or you know pay per click uh, on their own. Um, because, you know, we're bringing them a built-in audience of readers. Um, the clicks are obviously not as high as, uh, as it would be if we're just sending them straight to Amazon. But um, from trying to remember, you know, probably in the 8 to 12 cents per click. Now, I, I don't know how many of those are converting. Uh, once they get to the website, I wouldn't have that info. But... Um, I mean, not bad. I mean, when you consider the cost when you're going out and trying to do pay-per-click on your own. Yeah, plus, you know, uh, making a book perma-free is kind of tricky, and maybe you don't want to do that for a book below a certain length, for example. And there's right. the issue of, like, if you're not perma-free, and, and then you have to use, like, your limited free promotion for, and, and 
you know, I can see, certainly see the value of having sort of a non-store link. Plus, uh, it seems like it would have a little bit more flexibility. Like when people get to your to your, you know, if it's your author site, for example, if you're hosting it yourself, then there's all the stuff around it that's like, oh, and here's the rest of the books, and here's that and the other. So it seems like that in particular would give some additional promotional opportunities to people. It does. Um, and like uh, we have one author that does um, mystery books and he we're sending people to his uh, publisher's website where he's got some uh, free books there. And so he's trying to get people to sign up that way, get uh, customers on his mailing list. Um, but for authors, I think it's a good strategy because uh, if you're even just a small budget devoted to um, retargeting ads, uh, once you've got those people to visit your website, um, you know, f as long as, uh, you know, the, the, the cookies aren't and the caches aren't cleared out, you're, you should be able to go back and market to those people again. So my question for you, are there any genres or book subjects that Fussy Librarian shies away from? We're pretty open. Um, Let's see, I think I've rejected a 9-11 truther book. Um, and maybe one or two books that were kind of uh, political violence that were kind of political fiction slash, I mean, I'm not really gonna do like Turner Diaries stuff. Uh, I'm not interested in spreading, uh, you know, uh, is okay. it safe to assume that those authors that write books in the, let's just say, educational side of the internet aren't uh, encouraged to submit their books to you? Uh, it all depends on what they're educating people about. But, um, like, I mean, we, we run, um, we promote erotic romance. Um, we promote uh, LGBT literature. Um, you know, and I don't mind if books are political. But, um, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm really not interested in providing uh, material that just openly promotes hatred of religions or races, that kind of stuff. Um, and frankly, if people want to find that, there's plenty of places on the internet they can go and find it if they want it. Real, real quick, are, how many books would you say Fussy Librarian has said no to? Because it sounds like there's probably not many. Not many. Um, I mean, sometimes they don't meet review requirements, but just on the basis of content, uh, fewer than a half dozen over the five years. Yeah, so not many. Those had to be pretty special books. <laughs> you yeah. have to go out to YouTube to, to find those guys' channel if you want that stuff, I guess. Exactly, and I'm sure they, these guys do have YouTube channels, so. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm curious, you mentioned that you spent, uh, was 150000 on uh, marketing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what kind of marketing are you guys doing and finding effective? I'm curious if it's the same stuff we're doing as authors on Facebook and the various sites. It is. Um, it's uh, uh, Facebook advertising, uh, cost per lead advertising on Facebook, and um, uh, a lot of, you know, trial and error. Um, gotten better at it um worked with a, some agencies for a while and um, found that they really weren't doing a much better job than i was <laughs> and um and like well why pay them a monthly fee for what i'm already doing and doing about the same so um uh earlier this year uh cost per our cost per subscriber was probably oh it's Ranged from a dollar fifty to a dollar seventy five a piece, but um, it's come down in the last couple months. Um, I'm not sure if we're getting better at it or um, there's uh, some of the fallout from some of the privacy scandals means there's just less advertising going on. But um, we're seeing uh, it more in the now like the one twenty to one forty range. So, um, and when you're you know you're spending. You know, if you're spending ten thousand dollars a month, you know that can mean that's a big difference in terms of the number of new subscribers you can add. Do you find that folks stick around for a while after they sign up? Yeah, the uh, the churn is not that bad. I mean, um, 
there is some every day. I mean, whether it's people unsubscribing or an email that goes bad or um, the mailbox gets full and there's what they call a soft, soft bounce, which eventually will lead to uh, that address being scrubbed. But yeah, there's always um, a couple dozen every day that unsubscribe or, or we lose through it for other various reasons. Um, but that's just the nature of having a list that large. Right. Even uh, authors with just a few hundred folks, you know, there's, there's usually someone when you, you email that they don't remember that they signed up for the list or <laughs> they are uh, just done with it. Or they don't understand what it is. Um, you know, occasionally there are people who sign up and think that, um, you know, they're supposed to email us back and let us know what, uh, you know, mail this book to my address and was like, oh, no, that's not how it works. And it's, 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 it's great that you think we're capable of providing a mail order service to all of you, but it's, that's not, that's not how it works. I don't have a shop of elves. Helping yeah, me. We've talked about on the show before how it's very impressive how readers who you think would be the higher you know, more educated, maybe more intelligent folks often don't read like the product description or, you know, the, the email you just sent. I've certainly had ones. I'm like, okay, book three won't be out till next month. And I get a reply back. Okay. So when is book three coming out? Exactly. <laughs> it happens. And uh, you'd be surprised how many of them are surprised when I tell them that there really aren't free, that there aren't free audio books. Cause that's, the number one request I get is free audiobooks, and all I can say is go to your local library and check one out because um, I don't. There are actually Prime does, I think for Prime subscribers, there's usually a couple books each month where there are free audio books, but, uh, but that's about it. And, um, yeah, there used to be a site called Podio Books that uh, kind of facilitated if you had all the rights to your audiobook and produced it yourself you know, putting it up on iTunes chapter by chapter at a time, but I think they've kind of fallen by the wayside. So I guess you're out of luck, audiobook folks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as far as uh, before we talked about, like an uh, author probably shouldn't run the same book over and over and, and be surprised if they get fewer downloads. Uh, it, it does sound like you're marketing, getting new people all the time. How often do you think it's okay to run like book one in your flagship series? Uh, are you talking about a free promotion or a bargain promotion? Is it much different? <laughs> um, or maybe you should alternate, do the bargain one first and then eight months later or something, try it as a freebie. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend doing it more than every two to three months. Um, we don't have, um, we don't have any hard and fast rules on how often you can promote, but I, I if someone asks me, that's what I tell them. I think you, you want to, not do it too frequently because you need to wait for new subscribers to come aboard. Yeah, I actually have some questions about that later. But for now, uh, earlier I talked about how uh, if, if you're on a budget and you're running your own mailing list, then it's sometimes useful to try to find the people who are dead weight on your list. Although frequently analytics make it kind of hard to figure out how those people are. It, it, I would imagine for a service like you, it's less of a concern. You're really looking for numbers because, you know, just the more the better in that case. Do you ever go through and just sort of uh, look for people who maybe have never opened an email or, or do you feel that like the analytics aren't trustworthy to that degree? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it gets so expensive at some point that I think you've got to do some maintenance. Um, like MailChimp right now for the free email list is thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars a month for one hundred thirty-five thousand subscribers. So yeah, I mean, there becomes a point where it's like it's costing me money. That yeah, there is some dead weight here, and it's probably costing me money. Um, so yeah, you do need to look at trust the analytics analytics to some degree and make some decisions. Yeah, I know that's a thing that, that sort of drives, oh, I, I'm projecting a little bit, but that's the sort of thing that drives authors, i.e. me, a little bit nuts, is like, on one hand, well, it seems like only about, you know, it seems like a, at least a third of my list has never opened an email. But on the other hand, 
you, if ever you send out an email to say, hey, listen, these people who never open stuff, we're going to take you off the list. Uh, you'll always get at least a few who are like, no, no, please don't take me off. I don't know why it says I didn't open it. I open it every week. So there's a degree of paranoia associated with that sort of thing. Yeah, and I, I think it's justified paranoia. <laughs> okay, so I have a question. Is there anything you've discovered in your years of running Fussy Librarian that authors would be surprised to learn is incredibly effective in increasing their subscriber list? Like some little known trick that they like anybody should be doing that could actually increase their list for them? Uh, well, it's a pretty well-known trick, but um, a lot of people don't still don't do it, and that is put your email address in the back of the book. Um, I mean, it's just a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do that. Um, that, uh, you know, it's just a super easy way that people who love your books will get in contact with you, um, get them on your list, let them know about your upcoming releases. Um, Would you recommend putting like, let's say for instance, your email address back there as well as let's say a link to your website that like your newsletter sign up sort of thing, or you should have how, how many different uh, uh, calls should you have on the back of your book? Do you think? Uh, I probably wouldn't do more than two. Um, I would, I would definitely do links to your other books as well. Um, but I'd probably do the, the email address, but also a link to, to a sign up form to, if you want to make it easier for them. With, with, with regards to links to other books, and we've had other people that other of our guests that have said, you know, instead of having to constantly go in there, like as you write more books, it's always going in there and adding more links to whatnot. Do you, do you think it's a good idea? Let's have like, like my case, I have one link in there that says for other titles by me, yeah. click here, which takes me over to your blog, my blog and my book list. And that way they can see for themselves in one click. That way I never have to worry about changing all the links at all the time. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not comfortable with doing your own formatting, then I think that's a good strategy. Um, and if, especially if you have a lot of titles, um, uh, yeah, or, or you can do a link to the author page on Amazon as well. Um, but if it's in a series, um, I would recommend doing a link to the series page for the book um, because they're more likely to want to continue in that, uh, continue in that universe that they've started exploring. Yeah, I don't think it can hurt if you already have the link for the next book in the series. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> to put like here's book two and it's you can order it right now exactly. even if it says to pre-order at that point uh, i this did make me think of a like years ago on somebody's internet marketing uh video they were saying they'd experimented with their actual sign up form where you know it's like name and email address and they found that if you put like this big blue arrow pointing kind of pointing to the form that they had a big increase in their conversion and people that actually signed up on the page i don't know do you ever tinker with your landing page or, or play with stuff like that um we did with um uh one the, one of the things that confuses authors or i'm sorry confuses readers the most is uh how amazon designs the page and lays out the kindle unlimited part right in the price box and it's amazing how many people um confuse Kindle Unlimited with that they can, they can download a free ebook, but don't have to be a member of Kindle Unlimited to do so. And so we, yeah, we created a graphic that you know, has an arrow and, you know, to the right button and click here. And, and that's, I just got to just drop it back into the email. I replied to them um, to, to show exactly what they need to do. But yeah, I think there's, you know, you don't want to insult your reader, but anything you can do to make things easier and simpler for them, I, I think, is a good idea. I should say I have never done the arrow, but I believed the guy. It seemed because it made it more noticeable, you know, when you got a blog or something and there's a bunch of things in the menu. I will agree with you that Amazon can be a little confusing there. I've, I had to finally turn off the one click purchase thing because every time I was on there with my phone, I'd accidentally buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, <laughs> I was just trying to like get the sample. So are there, um, we can't, you kind of mentioned this before, but um, as far as trends go, are there any 
uh, genres that you see coming on strong or I don't know if you I know you've got quite a few uh, split uh, you can burrow down not <laughs> burrow that's a good word why not into different uh, sci-fi cat subcategories have you noticed that any like hey we're getting a lot of space opera uh, readers subscribers right now or anything doing well this year um seeing a lot of um I don't, know, I don't know what it means, but I'm seeing a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction um, and end times, preppers, blankets, the fan type books. Um, that's it. But, um, and then um, also seeing an awful lot of um, kind of young adult fantasy crossover. Um, it seems like uh, uh, kind of what was big, uh, the kind of YA paranormal was, I think, all the rage a couple of years ago. It kind of feels like we're kind of shifting more into the fantasy area, I think, with the young adult readership. But I, I don't know. If, I'd be curious to see what you guys are seeing. Um, I do notice we're seeing fewer uh, box sets than we used to, and that just goes across all genres. I think that probably has to do with, um, uh, my guess is Kindle Unlimited uh, payment changes and maybe a realization that um, uh, the bestseller designation really isn't everything it's cracked up to be unless you can put like New York Times bestseller in front of that. Um, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, I was actually mentioning as one of my predictions for uh, 2018 that I think box sets are maybe going to make a comeback or work more effectively now because there do seem to be fewer of them like for a while it was like everything in the top 20 for you mm -hmm. know a category was <laughs> it's a 99 cent box set and I, I do think you're right that uh, Kindle Unlimited they've kind of uh, done a number of things to make those not quite as profitable as they were there for a while. Right I think there was a page cap in terms of payment and so um yeah, no, I mean, I think there's definitely, they can be effective. I just, I'm not sure the ones, the sets that are, you know, 20 different authors and 20 books. I'm not sure if those sets, uh, you know, financially make the same sense that they might have a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, that sort of thing was was more of a of a promotional tool for, the, for most of the people involved. Um, all right, so... One of the things that I, I like about uh, Fussy Librarian is you've got a more nuanced genre selection, like uh, Jeff was talking about earlier. Um, for example, you've got general fantasy, but also epic fantasy is a separate thing. What sort of drives the decision to subdivide certain things into into uh, you know finer genres? Uh, read uh, author feedback. Um, yeah, we started at the very beginning five years ago. We started out with just general fantasy, and then uh, quickly learn from the authors that they um, they really would appreciate it if we could uh, separate out uh, urban and epic and so that's that's what we did I know that you also have uh, basically a romance version of a lot of your other genres I know that we've had people on the show who talk about how it's hard to have say for example a sci-fi romance because if you just do it as romance people who like it needs to be sci-fi romance, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I, I, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who really appreciate having the ability to say, ah, well, that's the specific type of romance I am instead of just a blanket romance. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we, yeah, we do that. Like, we have a romance Western category, which is a pretty specific kind of book. And, um, uh, you know, it's not a huge category, but there's a very dedicated group of people looking for those types of books. So it's nice to be able to uh, to give them those type of stuff they like to read. You mentioned just a little bit ago that uh, that fan you believe fantasy was starting to make like a strong comeback or whatnot. So I was kind of curious: is that, have you noticed any patterns? Like, like what seems to be trending right now? Is it the fantasies that are seem to be doing the best on yours you know, for the ads or whatnot? Or I mean, I was wondering how much data you had at your hands. Uh, I, was, I was saying, uh, in terms of uh, books being submitted, I think I'm, we're seeing more young adult slash fantasy books than maybe in the past. Um, they've always been 
those those genres have always been pretty popular. Um, in terms of um, uh, clicks on our list, um, science fiction and fantasy uh, both perform about at the average mark. Um, with um, uh, probably mysteries, thrillers, and romance at the top, um, and then um, mysteries know, at the top. All right, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, and then things like fantasy and uh, and sci-fi at about average, and then um, kind of the the harder to not the, the books, but the perform less are going to be things like. Um, uh, children's books, which are always a difficult market, and um, uh, LGBT literature, um, African American, I mean, some of the more specialized niches uh, have fewer, uh, fewer clicks, but we're, and we're also working to uh, kind of establish uh, lower price points for them so that everyone's paying roughly uh, the same amount per click. Wait, now that leads to the question, are there any genres that you wish you'd see more of? Uh, it's gonna sound, you're gonna be surprised, but I'm gonna say, tell you Westerns. I get requests all the time for Westerns. Um, and there just aren't a lot of people writing them anymore. Um, they write, um, and not, his, not a historical romance. Um, that they want the the Zane Gray type stuff. What what about like a Western sci-fi or a Western fantasy or just strictly Western? Strictly Western. Although I'm a big fan of Westworld, but uh, no, they generally want uh, strictly Western. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I'd love to see uh, more cozy mysteries too because they perform so well. Um, uh, oh, you just made my night. <laughs> I write um, cozy mystery, but uh, nonfiction as well. I think um, people don't um, really good memoirs. Um, I think resonate with people. Um, uh, cookbooks do surprisingly well on our free list in particular. Um, so, but yeah, westerns. <laughs> as I will now go out and plot my western series. <laughs> of that stuff as a kid i loved all that the frontier kidnapped by indians it was okay to call them indians back then uh good times but and that makes a lot of sense that that's kind of i know that's a niche that the hollywood is kind of abandoned and uh the publishers you don't see a whole lot of westerns coming out so there probably are a lot of hungry readers out there for anybody out there that uh <laughs> that could be your thing and uh, i know we if you're on keyboards, you've seen, um, I think it's Wayne Stimmett, is how you say his name? He got, he was like a sea, sea adventure category. That there was hardly anybody in when he got started. And he, you know, really found that he could rank in the top 20. And, and it was an audience that was craving sea adventures. <laughs> Not the, uh, the master commander type stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, if you go to some of those categories on Amazon, just burrow through there and, uh, you know, you never know. If, if it's something you enjoy writing. Uh, speaking of Amazon, do you guys have any preferences or see any uh, bad feedback or anything if you do only KU exclusive with Amazon stuff? Or do you like prefer books where you can have links to all the stores? Um, well, the Nook readers would definitely prefer links to all the stores and we do hear from them, but um, you know, that we to, you know, that's totally the author's decision and um, they need to do what's best for them. Um, I, I think it probably, if you're gonna do a perma-free, I think it makes sense to go wide, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, for, I was talking with um, Hugh Howey about this uh, not too long ago and he's mainly, exclusive to Kindle these days. And, um, and he, as you know, he does, he does a lot of data stuff. And, um, and what he found was, um, you know, the other retailers just weren't making up for what he was making if, when he was with, uh, with Amazon. And he said, you know, if you ask me if, um, 
he said, if you were to ask me, would you rather have uh, 10 million readers east of the Mississippi River or 1 million readers spread across the entire United States, you know, it's, you know, don't worry about the geography, you know, it's all about the numbers and what works best for you. Yeah, we've definitely had people on the show that pointed out, I, I think maybe Nick Webb did it uh, right here on the show, that uh, Amazon is the biggest ebook store in the world, and then Kindle Unlimited is the second biggest ebook store in the world. Yep. Um, and if you can do well there, certainly it's uh, worth, it is, I, I will say I've launched series in there, I don't leave them there forever, but I, made, I make a lot more than when I was launching wide, and it's just, it is, it's like you get your sales money, and then you get this whole bonus money from the page read stuff, and if you're doing well, it's it's hard to not <laughs> want to take advantage of that. I wish it wasn't the case, but um, you know, at some point we need to to Amazon proof our industry, and because um, uh, you know, I mean, history shows that when uh, there's one giant monopoly, that it people end up getting hurt in the long run, <laughs> you know, um, and that, uh, so, I mean, we, we need to figure out an alternative, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, you're certainly nervous if you're relying fully or almost fully on Amazon for your income, and, you know, they always seem to be fiddling with some things, people are getting kicked out, you know, for reasons, <laughs> or uh, they've been taking away page reads the last couple months, right. you know, they figured those were scam bot things or something, and here, if you've already counted that money and you were depending on it to have it disappear two weeks later, that's, that's rough. Yeah, and it's hard because they don't employ enough human beings. To, I mean, it's a lot of it is automated and algorithms, and it's really hard to get a human being to uh, give you an answer and uh, to help fix your problems. So it's it's definitely frustrating for a lot of authors. Do you feel for those authors who are have maybe tried KU and it they just got lost and you know they didn't see a big boost, or they're just not interested in doing it and really want to do wide? That there's an opportunity. Like, are you guys getting uh, so many exclusive ones that maybe your like your Nook readers are excited and more likely to buy a book that comes their way that is for them? Well, we are we are going to be launching a, a page on our website just for Nook books, um, so that they have a place to go. And um, uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, that will be something for them, that authors that do choose to go wide and we'll, um, we'll feature them uh, longer on that page um, than we would probably for the Kindle books, just because there's uh, not as many of them. So um, one, of the, one of the things we did with our redesign is we put all of our free eBooks um, at the bottom of the homepage and, uh, there's probably 75 to 100 there on any given day. And um, we uh, were trying to, we've got some programming issues that we're still working out, but um, using cookies, we're gonna make it possible so that uh, visitors can uh, pick what genres they want so that they don't see a list of 75. They, you know, they just like science fiction and fantasy. It'll just display those two genres when they come and visit the website. So. Um, but we're going to then duplicate that for both Nook books as well as our uh, our bargain ebooks too. Cool. Um, on the subject of of, of Amazon, um, it looks like your bargain list, like in its requirements, heav heavily relies upon Amazon ratings and reviews. Uh, let's say that somebody has been particularly they've been wide forever, and they for whatever reason have developed a, a, a readership that is skewed toward one of the non-Amazon sites. Do you ever make any like exceptions for a book that's exceptionally well-reviewed elsewhere, but not so much on Amazon? We do. It is very, very rare, but uh, once in a while we'll come across someone that um, they've got 25 reviews on Barnes and Noble, but four on Amazon and sure. Yeah, that's, that's an easy call to make. Yeah, it's good. Again, you know, when there's a human being involved in the process, a determination like that can be made. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, but um, I noticed that permafree you permafree is often a mark against a book. 
on places like BookBub, where like, well, this book's been free for so long, there's gonna be less people who are excited about it. And Fussy Librarian actually has a subscription model for a perma-free book thing. Have you seen uh, any people like taking advantage of subscribing for recurring uh, uh, promotion? Yeah, we've uh, there, we probably have about 20 people doing it right now. Um, it's just a way to make it easier for authors because uh, we know that um, they uh, want to spend more time writing and less time on all the paperwork and business end of it. So um, they want to promote something every other month. They, uh, you know, first Friday of the month, they just send us the information once we set it up, send them an invoice when it comes time. And if for some reason they, uh, they decide they want to pass that month, they just let us know and we canceled the invoice. So it's, it's pretty easy to set up and just makes it easier for the authors. Okay, with regards to perma free titles, you've already touched briefly that, you know, it's still a viable way for authors to get their books out there. Would you feel that is, let's just say if the author has two or three different series, should they just plan on making book one perma free just to get their series started? Or we've heard from a lot of people that say, well, offer, I'll offer one of my books perma free, but then you just kind of cycle it through because I personally will, will toggle it through. I've got like four different series now and I'll usually have one of them perma free, but I'm toying with the idea of just making book one of every one of them perma free again. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. I think it depends on whether, is it a series that the reader can go in either direction uh, I, I, well, I write them as, you know, it's, it's not necessary to read all of them in there, but it helps. Then for, for, if it sort of helps to have the knowledge of the earlier books, then I'm a fan for just making the first in the series free um, and using that as your reader magnet. Um, but if it can go in either order, um, if you can read it in, in backwards or forwards, then... Um, yeah, then I think you probably could rotate them like you're doing. Um, you know, I, uh, but you know, I'm a big fan of first in the series and then discounting as little as possible on the other books. Um, or at least if you're gonna discount, stay above um, 299 so you get that higher royalty. All right. Well, we are just about out of questions for you. We appreciate you coming on. And uh, we should point out, we didn't talk about pricing for you guys at all. Uh, for Considering you guys have been around a while, you're still quite affordable for authors. So it's not like they're gambling $100 on right. you know, a site that may or may not deliver. Maybe they've heard mixed things about. Um, I think it's about 14 for fantasy maybe 17 for sci-fi for a bargain book and then it looks like 30 for the free books that's correct yeah yeah we like to uh we, we like to keep it at a price point that everyone can afford um and the the free list is sort of growing at market rates if you will um and i'd like to keep growing that um trying to stay in like i mean we'll never be able to match book bubs uh cost per reader if you will until you know we're a lot larger um but we would like to try to get as close to that as possible for now and try to stay uh keep it a really good value and then um and sort of kind of pass the savings on to the people on the bargain side because um you know we, re we recognize how hard it is to sell books so we want to try to keep those keep those affordable Right. And it's, we appreciate that there are more options, you know, BookBub's great, but not many people can get it. And even the people that get it don't get it very often. <laughs> so it's nice to have other alternatives, especially, you know, a lot of folks will stack them and do like have a week where they have their book free and they can do Fussy Librarian and a couple of the other sites and, you know, get still thousands of, of downloads and then not spend a whole lot of money on it. Well, I, I mean, I know this is going to sound, uh, I don't know, crazy, but, um, you know, it, there can be another book bub out there. I mean, it's not a once in a lifetime thing. I mean, I've got a plan that would get us up there, you know, probably in two, two and a half years, uh, just by reinvesting our revenue back into growing our free newsletter. Um, but it, but it all comes down to having more orders each month. Um, you know, right now we do about 
500, 400, 500 orders a month for the free ebook newsletter. But if we can become uh, in the range of, you know, 900 to 1,000 or so, you know, that gives us the money that we can then plow back into more marketing and things start growing quickly. So um, it can be done. It's just a matter of, uh, it's a matter of math and being willing to sink that money back into the business. And uh, we're willing to do that if people will come and promote their books with us. Well, there you go, guys. Your $30 not only gets you on the newsletter, but you're helping create the next <laughs> book bub uh, competitor. Which, and it's the same thing as Amazon. You know, we, it's healthier for us if we have more options. And, you know, so there's, it's good to support <laughs> more than just the big, big chief, I guess we'll call them. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, do you want to just, I mean, the fussy librarian.com, uh, people can probably remember that, but I will put it in the show notes. Are there any other uh, sites or projects you want to plug before we let you go? Uh, just that if anybody has any questions, um, just go to the website at the contact button and I will uh, get back to you. If not immediately, as soon as I wake up in the morning. <laughs> All right, cool. For everyone listening, this is episode 185. If you need to come by the site and get the show notes and uh, the link to, you probably, they'll probably remember it easier than our URL. <laughs> but we're marketing sff.com if you guys want to pop in. But um, go to the Fussy Librarian and uh, I'm going to have to go book something now because I haven't been by for a while. So Excellent. Must be two, time. two of us. <laughs> Yeah, Joe's, Joe's going to be in there booking all his cozy mysteries and, and now that you've let him know. Right. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. All right. Take it easy. Nice to meet you, Jeffrey. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.